We are at the end of Surah Al-Ahzab, Surah number 33, and ayah number 69. 69. Billahi min shaytan rajim, bismillahi rahmani rahim. يا أيها الذين آمنوا لا تكونوا كالذين آذوا موسى فبرأه الله مما قال وكان عند الله وجيها O oh, you who believe don't become like those who hurt and uh, insulted Musa عليه السلام and as a result Allah سبحانه وتعالى uh, exonerated him vindicated him against whatever they charged him and accused him. And he was indeed very, very noble and eminent in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As I've been mentioning throughout the surah, one of the major themes of the surah is to preserve and save the institution of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam of the finality of prophethood and to instruct believers not to hurt him that they should not hurt him they should not uh, impede him they should not insult him they should not demean him etc. in any way shape or form so at the end of the surah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions very explicitly it is theme that oh you who believe if you believe in Allah and his rasul then do not become like those who hurt and insulted Musa السلام, meaning the Banu Israel in his time his own people while he was with them they had many occasions and instances when they tried to undermine him and his authority throughout his life as a Nabi this is the general understanding of this ayah from the Quran as the Quran explains itself. قَالُوا يَا مُوسَىٰ قَدْ أُوذِينَا مِنْ قَبْلَ أَنْ تَأْتِيَنَا وَمِنْ بَعْلِ مَا جِئْتَنَا Then Musa alayhi salam when he is asking his people to be patient and to you know look forward towards the future the people of Musa said O oh Musa we were persecuted before you came and after you came. So what's the difference? For yeah. the we have been hurt before you came and then after you came. So that in that way they were hurting the Nabi and they were challenging the authority of the Prophet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to send this Nabi to save them from the Fir'aun and to give them a better future, at least in the Akhirah. So that is the general uh, outlook of the Banu Israel towards Musa salam throughout their lives both in Egypt and after they were delivered from the Firaun outside of Egypt in the desert and so on. They were given now food and drink in the desert and they said to Musa salam لَن نَصْبِرْ عَلَىٰ طَعَامٍ وَاحِدٍ that this food is now monotonous. It is boring. What kind of food is boring in the desert where there is no water and there is no quail and there is no bread. So they were given water, quail and bread. Sweet bread early in the morning. Or something like that. Not cooked or ready made but whatever it was. So they could not uh, appreciate the role of Musa as being the giver and the one who gave them blessings of food in the desert and water in the desert they uh, didn't want to fight over their water so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told Musa alayhi salam to strike his staff on a stone idrib bi asat al-hajr strike strike the stone then uh, twelve springs came out from that rock from a boulder and each tribe would be able to water themselves and fill up their their containers and uh, water skins every day without any fight, without any trouble, and so on. As soon as they 
left Egypt and went into the desert and they came upon a group of people, the Akufun Ala Hastan, that uh, they were worshipping uh, some idol. And they said to Musa, Ijalana ilahan kamalum aliha. The people of Musa said, Ya oh, Musa, we want an idol like these people have idols. Right. So wherever they went, the people of Musa always hurt Musa alayhi salam. Always. Meaning that was their pattern. This is what the Quran says. As far as the tafsir of this particular ayah, the Quran has a very broad general outlook towards the tafsir, which I say should be the way. We look at this ayah because it was not just one occasion which uh, some of the Mufassirun referred to, which I'll explain that also. But it was the general uh, inability of the people of Musa to appreciate Musa as a Nabi because they wanted to measure Musa salam, and his Nabuwa according to the pleasures of life. How much pleasure have you brought into our lives? That is how they wanted to measure him. Then, the culmination of this was that Musa as being part of the Banu Israel, also was in the wilderness, the desert, for many, many years. You know? And then, at a time when he was supposed to have private time and take a shower of ghusl behind the rock, when the, one of some of the people observed him and they started making fun of him. And that is what the Muqassirun say is the reference to which is plausible, but it's not the whole story. Okay. And so on. Anyway, this is now Musa a.s. was then uh, taken to task about his body, about his physique, and everything else. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَبَرَأَهُ اللَّهُ مِمَّا قَالُ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exonerated him and disapproved of what they were saying and made him even closer to him and raised his ranks amongst the angels and the people and those who are in the heaven and in front of him also وَكَانَ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ وَجِيهَا He was very honorable and looked uh, at with great pleasure and favor by Allah and the angels and now in this ummah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has raised the ranks of Musa through the believers of this Prophet sallallahu that the Ummah of Muhammad وسلم, appreciates Musa far more than his own people did in his time. وَكَانَ in the اللَّهِ وَجِيهَا So as the hadith says, that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala favors someone and loves someone, he will inform Jibreel. Jibreel will then announce to the angels and everyone in the heavens, Allah loves this person, so you must love him also. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as the hadith says, you the Allahul Qabul, that acceptance will be placed on earth for that person. So with uh, the earlier prophets who were not well liked by their own people, uh, especially those who rejected them, the Banu Israel did not reject Musa, and they just didn't like the idea of trial and tribulation and being patient all the time. And they, some of them obviously loved him, and most of them did not appreciate what they were going through. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has now placed Qabul, acceptance of Musa in the Quran so that every Muslim loves Musa salam the way Allah wants him to. وَكَانَ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ وَجِيهِ Right. That the Ummah of Muhammad وسلم, stands as a witness against those from the Banu Israel, whether they were in the past or present, who do not appreciate who Musa is. Where Muslims appreciate who Musa Islam is, because every time you read in the Quran, Musa, 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 we make dua for him. This is how Allah works. So, 
when Allah loves someone, then the qabool may come in that person's lifetime, and the qabool may come post-mortem, or seamlessly, afterwards. And that is how Allah favors people, and that's the way He works, and that's how He establishes Himself amongst those who want to believe in Him and love the people that He has chosen. So this is another understanding of this ayah, that when uh, you do what Allah wants you to do, people after you will respect and appreciate what it is you have done. So here Allah is saying to the believers that don't do this with your Nabi, meaning that uh, all you who believe now in Medina, if you do not respect and honor the Prophet a time will come or when other people will respect and appreciate him as a warning to the munafiqoon of Medina and over to those who might become slightly complacent that the Prophet is with us and so on. And also as a reference to us today that we should not behave the way that the people of Musa al-Islam behaved and dishonor and hurt and insult the Prophet ﷺ because Allah has his way of raising the ranks of prophets and you will be subject to humiliation on the Day of Judgment if you did this to your Nabi the way they did that to their Nabi. Hence the next ayah. يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا you who believe fear Allah throughout the Quran this term is used fear Allah اتقوا الله then what follows is the necessary course of action that will give us the understanding of how to fear Allah through this ayah so in this ayah Allah says اتقوا الله how does Allah want us to fear Him through this ayah? وَقُولُوا قَوْلًا And say a good word, a forthright word, a correct word, sadeed, a word that is accurate. Hold a statement that is true and that is accurate. قُولُوا قَوْلًا Whether it's in your personal life, your domestic life, or your public life, social life, your legal life, or your political life, whichever life you are leading, private or public, you must speak a good word, a correct word, Poland Sadida, that which leads towards the truth and does not deceive people into thinking otherwise. Kulu Poland Sadida. If you have this approach in life, you will be fearing Allah. If you don't have this approach in life, you will not be fearing Allah. So fear in Allah has to be, uh, the fear of Allah has to be translated in your public and private statements. If you believe that your statement is going to be accurate and correct and truthful, then the, uh, the product of this, the natija of this, if you want to call it that, will be yuslih lakum a'malakum. You, Allah will then reform and correct for you your actions. It is because you don't believe in holding a correct statement that your actions become incorrect. So here the difference between certain ideologies is that people judge you according to what you do and in other ideologies we Muslims judge according to what people say first and then do second. Right. If you say, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, we will see you as a Muslim. If you behave like a Muslim and you do all the good things that Islam says you do, you should do, but you don't believe in Allah and the Rasul, we will not say you are Muslim. Kulu Kolan Sadida comes first. Make the correct and accurate statement first. Then that statement will help you correct and reform and improve your actions and not uh, allow you to disintegrate and to do things that are against the Quran and so So you must say and speak what is 
correct and sadeed that leads towards the truth. Then Allah will reform you and your actions. People who say that our actions uh, reflect our statements, that is true. But our actions are guided by our statements, not the other way around. So Islam is based on testifying first and then your salat, salam, zakat, hajj. Second, if you do not testify that Allah is one and Muhammad sallallahu is his servant and his rasul, then you can pray as much as you want. Your prayers will not be accepted. Right? Because you're not a Muslim. Right, that's one way. However, your statement should improve you and your behavior as not a human being but as a Muslim because the, the address is to Ya Yuhalladin Amal. Or you who believe, if you fear Allah, fear Allah first. If you fear Allah, you'll do this. What will you do first? You will correct your statements and make a good statement. And then on the back of that, your, your actions will also be reformed and improved and so on. If this is the whole package, then يَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ ذُنُوبَكُمْ Allah then will forgive for you your sins. So, what is the ultimate purpose of a human being's life in this world that he meets Allah as Allah has forgiven him? Is that the purpose? Whether you have a small apartment in which you live or whether you have a huge mansion in which you live, whether you earn 40 grand a year, 20 grand a year or whether you earn 200 or 400 grand a year. What is the purpose of a Muslim's life? The purpose is as we die, and when we die, Allah, uh, we ask Him to forgive us. That is your objective. As a Muslim, qulu qawlan sadida. Holding this view is your statement. Then this view, if you have this world view, that my statement in my mind to me and to others is that this is the objective of my life. I want Allah to forgive me then this will improve and reform your behavior and your actions. And then Allah will forgive you. But if from the outset you have decided that the purpose of my life is not what's going to happen to me in my grave or on the day of judgment, the purpose of my life is to enjoy, 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 no matter what comes. And then I'll deal with God when I see Him. You don't say this, but you behave this way. So this is how we see that this ayah is recited in the khutbah of marriage. And next time you hear uh, somebody performing the nikah and he's been trained uh, as an alim to perform the nikah, uh, not those who are not trained. Those who are trained to perform nikah, they will read this ayah. Because it's one of the prophets also. He would read this ayah at the time of the khutbah of nikah. O you who believe, fear Allah and utter a correct statement. What is your statement when you get married? That you are going to honor your vows. When you say, I have accepted you, I do whatever you say. Qabiltu, qabulkiya. What is that statement? That statement has to be sadeed. It has to be accurate and it has to be correct. So what is the implication of that? The implication of that is I will never break my vow in marriage. Is that true? And that's correct in every civilization, every religion. No civilization, no religion will say that you as a human being have the prerogative to break your mar- marital vow because it's about fun. Do they? I hope not. <laughs> That's hedonism. Right? That's selfishness. So at the time of the khutbah of nikah, this uh, has been recited by the Prophet and by the khatibs who performed the nikah. 
and they are issuing a statement that we, when we say I have accepted uh, the marriage proposal, etc., I have proposed to marry somebody, that's your statement. This statement, if you internalize it, and you become it, will reform your behavior in marriage. Yuslih the And when this behavior is reformed in marriage, Allah will say, Ya fulfill lakum dhunubakum. He will forgive your sins. As long as you know that this is the way you should behave, and you do behave that way. But if you go into the marriage, or if you behave in marriage hypocritically, this is the hypocrisy that the Quran has alluded to in the previous ayah, that if you are a hypocrite, you will hurt the Prophet, and you will hurt Muslims by saying, it doesn't matter, it's my right. It's not your right. If it's your right, then don't get married in the first place. Don't uh, spoil the maghfirah, uh, the chances of forgiveness for another person, meaning your spouse and your children, because you want to engage in hedonism and selfish pleasure. Yeah, as the next eye will show us. At the end. يَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ ذُنُّ لَكُمْ وَمَنْ يُطِعَ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ فَقَدْ فَازَ فَوْزًا عَظِيمًا Whoever obeys Allah and the Rasul in matters of speaking, speech, and in matters of behavior, then he has uh, really succeeded. He has succeeded in a very tremendous way. فَقَدْ فَازَ فَوْزًا عَظِيمًا very tremendous, a huge success has come to this person who obeys Allah and his Rasul in these very critical issues of life. So, in our civilizational codes and values, we represent the Prophet ﷺ. So, what do we believe is the criterion for a good and successful marriage? That there is mutual trust between husband and wife. There is respect between husband and wife, and they behave in accordance with the vows of marriage. That is success. Foes. Foes. Success. Foes and Azima. Huge success. Is it the standard of a Muslim family and couple to say that because we do not have five cars and ten mansions, and God knows how much you are, four one k. Then no, our marriage is doomed. That is nifaq. That's different. Because marriage is not between your assets. Or not because of your assets. Marriage is between two human beings. I want to be with you, you want to be with me. Period. Right? Everything else is circumstantial. So, when you go out and travel in the world, and you go to poorer countries in the world, third world country, you'll see that human beings are happily married. MashaAllah. Why are they happily married? Because marriage is about them, it's not about money, it's not about their place of dwelling, it's not about their relatives, it's about them. How do they get on together themselves? This is how you measure foes. The word foes, which is huge, huge success. Oh, he's trying to his triumph, triumph. Not so, no, not so triumphant, but it means something less than that, yeah. Yeah, likewise, in a business contract, what is your code? That you honor each other's business contracts or your other con- social contracts. Or what is now your success in matters of ibadah? That I have taken a vow to obey Allah as Rasul in matters of ibadah. This is how I do my ibadah and this is when I do my ibadah. And likewise, everything else in life is all now enclosed in this one ayah. وَمَنْ يُطِعِ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولَهُ Whoever obeys Allah and his Rasul both in statement of fact and in behavior after the statement. فَقَدْ فَازَ فَوْزًا عَظِيمًا عظيم, huge, tremendous success independent of what happens in the outside world. The outside world should not dictate how you behave, how you think and how you look at the world. The world exists because of you. Right? If you're not there, the world doesn't exist. Is that true? If you die, the world is insignificant. You're not there, so the world is not there. So why don't you focus on you 
and your statement, your attitude, your approach, and your behavior, instead of saying, everything else around me is better or less. Think about you. In this way, then you will be successful. So here we see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the uh, climax of this surah, which focuses on the institution of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu his own personal life, as we saw with his marriage to Zainab, and his own public life, as we see in the institution of Nabuwa, uh, Khatu Nabuwa especially, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to safeguard the Prophet sallallahu being, his person, his mission, his institution of Nabuwa, in such a way that Muslims do not hurt him, whereby they will be hurting themselves. And the way that you are going to say that, when we say in nikah, and nikah min sunnati, nikah is part of my sunnah, we are representing the sunnah of the Prophet. When we are praying, sallu kama ra'aytumuni usalli, pray the way you see me praying. We are representing the method of prayer of the Prophet wasallam is not our individual prayer. Is that true? The khudu anni manasikakum. When we go for Hajj, the Prophet ﷺ said, take your Hajj rituals from me. So when we're performing our Hajj, we are representing Muhammad ﷺ. So in every aspect of our lives, where things are important to us in society and as individuals, we are representing the Prophet ﷺ. When you are cognizant of this and you realize this, then you will behave appropriately and accordingly. But if you feel my salat is independent of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, then you will not behave appropriately. Whatever works. Right. And you'll say, then women should lead prayer because it's a right. You will not represent the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and say, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam women should not lead prayer. Right. Why? My right. Meaning, if you say that you are representing the Prophet Wasallam, then he said no, and you're saying yes. So are you obeying Allah and Rasul, or are you obeying your nafs? Which one is it? So the discussion is not about rights, or human rights, or prerogative. The, the, the discussion is about following the Nabi, Wasallam. That's your civilizational code. I exist as a Muslim because I believe in Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam as the last Nabi. There is no wahi after him. So if he said Allah doesn't want you to offer salat this way, then we don't. And if he says you should not do your Hajj this way, then don't. And if he says you should not behave in your marriage this way, then then don't. If you have acquiesced to this, then you will be successful as a Muslim. If you have not acquiesced to this, and you are still rebelling against Allah and the Rasul, then you are hurting the Rasul. And when you hurt the Rasul, you will be the one who is hurt, because Allah has raised the ranks of the Prophet ﷺ so high, that we will benefit from his ranks being high. Allah loves him, the angels love him. All believers who are genuinely believers love him. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will show how much he loves him on the day of judgment on the member. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will raise him to the highest levels in front of all human beings. And everybody will see this is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa So now, if you have a beef against this man, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then that's to your detriment and it's at your peril. Not going to hurt him. It's going to hurt you. So this is the way you make a good statement, a correct statement, and this is how you behave, and you reform your behavior based on following a human being. Because the institution of prophethood is the institution of the best human beings, and Muhammad Sallallahu being the last is the best of all those prophets who came to deliver mankind from their ignorance and to show mankind the way of salvation and the way of forgiveness uh, towards Jannah, inshallah. 
this is how we appropriate that. The end of the surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is now bringing the initial statements in the beginning of the surah at the end. And this is how you wrap up the surah by saying the theme in the beginning is now reiterated in the end with different words. But the theme is the same, as you will see the next few ayat, which have a profound understanding of meaning. Many people have written many, many works on the next ayah, but we will go through it so that you understand the gist of it, inshallah. <laughs> Indeed, we had presented this amana and this trust, amana means trust, upon the heavens and the earth and the mountains. What is the meaning of the word amana in this verse, in this ayah? The scholars have several uh, ideas and opinions. One is it is the Quran. One is it is the aman and the trust of volition, your niya, that you have chosen the prerogative to do or not to do. And there are other, various other quotes from the Sibut. The two I've just highlighted are the most prominent. One is the Quran and the other is the burden of responsibility, taken on the responsibility of acting according to your niya and your volition, whichever way it is. Now, the question here, or the heavens and the earth and the mountains, they all refuse to carry this burden. Some of you know, means to refuse, to reject. That they didn't want to carry the burden of having a choice between obeying and disobeying or carrying the trust of the Qur'an and understanding God's will. Right. So the amana may refer to God's will, or it may refer to your will. One of the two. Right. That I have taken on the responsibility to understand God's will, in that case it's the Qur'an, uh, I have t- refused to take on the responsibility of my own will. And then it's about you, it's about your destiny, and what you do, what you don't do. So, the... Heavens and the earth, a huge, huge creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, seven heavens of Allah You can't even fathom the depth and the breadth and the, the might and the enormous and the being that the heavens are. Huge. Even from your little knowledge of astronomy today, it's huge. All the galaxies and Milky Way, and never mind that, the solar system, you know, the planet, it's huge. And then obviously the earth itself. The earth itself is now minuscule compared to the heavens. But the earth is blessed. Why? وَبَارَكَ فِيهَا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about the earth, Allah gave barakah to the earth for years and thousands of years and millions of years the earth has produced what it produces. Without fail, every day, every week, every month, every year, Every decade, every century, every millennium, the earth still produces, still produces, and there's much more to come. Right? So, the heavens are huge, and the earth is totally productive. Absolutely productive. Wa The Quran says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave barakah, placed barakah in earth, where so many products and produce literally come out. And so much food and sustenance is given to so many species. So Allah asked the earth also as he asked the heavens. Wal-jibal. And then he asked also the mountains that serve as pegs and serve as anchors on earth and serve as other purposes, other utilities of the the, um, mountains. Almost indestructible. Anyway. So these three creation, because they're usually seen as huge and spectacular, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we presented this amana, this trust to these three creation, 
of ours. Which implies that these three creation also have an understanding, an intellect. And there's some understanding before uh, you can say that I, I, I spoke to the glass or the phone or the table. And the glass and the phone and the table replied this, this and that. Right? So this implies that there's some aql there, this taqud, there's some understanding. Yeah. Which is also verified by the Quran. Qalata ataina So when Allah subhanahu wa spoke to the heavens and the earth, they both said, we will comply obediently. Ataina ta'een, we will comply obediently. We will come obediently to you. Whatever you want us to do, we will do. That shows that there is some measure of ta'aqul into that in these creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whether they, or not, they have a ruh or a soul or spirit, that's a different issue. But anyway, the ayah only makes sense if you say that there is some level of uh, understanding. And they refuse, they say, we can't do this, or we're not able, or we're not capable. That's one thing. The way that certain other Muslims may want to interpret this ayah is to say it was a matter of a cosmological denial because of their inner intrinsic innate nature. Right? So if you have certain rocks that will not hold water and reject water, then you can say that the rock rejected water. Metaphorically. Not literally or in reality which is plausible for some, is not the whole truth for others. Anyway, whichever way it is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala presented this amana, that I want you to take this amana, that the huge, huge heavens, all seven of them, uh, said either by choice, that they said this, or by their default nature. And earth said this, and the angels said this, that we're not able to, nor are we capable of carrying this trust that you want us to carry. And more than that, they could not bear this burden. They're incapable of bearing the burden. When a mother carries a child, okay, and uh, when it does not, when the mother rejects the child or the fetus and there's uh, an abortion or uh, a miscarriage, then that is when we use the word ashfaq. Ashfaqat, that is not able to carry the fetus to its term. Right? So here we see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is referring to even the, the, the most enormous of creation that he has created that they don't have the willpower to see it through. They don't have the compassion to see it through. They don't have the, the abilities to see this trust through. It is beyond them. This amal, whether it's the Qur'an, the knowledge of the Qur'an, or whether it's in their own volition of making a choice between right and wrong all the time. So then, وَحَمَلَهَا insan. insan who perhaps is the most insignificant of all creatures once he is conceived. Right? And you know this more than I do. So I got the clot that the Quran calls Alaq. Totally, totally insignificant. That insan carried this burden of saying, I will choose between right and wrong. I will choose between right or wrong. Oh, I'll carry the burden and I'll take the test of understanding the Quran, Allah's will and God's will and see that I can do something with it on earth so that when I meet you I can say I carry the burden. And so, on. so in San, by definition Allah says إِنَّهُ كَانَ ظَلُومًا جَهُولًا Not a good picture. <laughs> Allah is presenting about human beings. إِنَّهُ كَانَ ظَلُومًا Indeed, he, he was totally, totally unjust. In total, utter darkness, jahula, totally ignorant of his abilities, inabilities, capabilities, and so on. 
Yeah, if that hasn't depressed you, uh, then nothing else will. But you're doomed for failure and injustice, and you're doomed to be doomed. Innahu ka waluban jawlan. So where is the good news? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in this surah, وَمُبَشِّرُوا وَنَذِيرًا That we have sent you as a, someone who gives glad tidings and someone who warns also. So that this is the warning that man is not able to see through his amana, his trust. We have an amana with Allah, a covenant. We will follow him, obey his law. We have an amana to trust with the Prophet We will follow him and obey him. We have an amana with our parents. We will obey them and take care of them. We have an amana with our siblings and our grandfathers and our children and everybody else. We have an amana with our spouses. We have an amana with neighbors and amana and a trust with everybody else in the world that we will see this through. But when we say we will see this through, we are unjust because we never do. And we are ignorant because we have assumed that we can when we know we can at every level of man's inability to commit to what he or she has committed to is a natural state of man. This is a natural state of man. Here on earth. Post Jannah. No, not before Jannah. Post Jannah. After we came from there. So here we, we see that the, 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 the mountains understood and uh, the earth understood the heavens understood that they will not be able to carry the trust, whatever the trust is, and it was better for them. They said, Allah, keep us the way you want us to keep us without giving us the volition and the prerogative to say yes or no. Man is the greatest creature that is always going to be debating. It's always debating, debate, fight, debate, fight, debate, confront, reject, annoy, disappoint, all of these great values that we see in the world. Right. This is what man is. So now Allah's partner says that. We, we told you. The, the, the heavens said no, and the earth said no, and the mountains said no. They will do what they're supposed to do, and they were stripped of their volition. They have an understanding, but they don't have a volition. So a mountain will never move by itself out of his own volition. The earth will not move by itself out of his own volition and the heavens won't move because of themselves, because of their own volition. They are moved when they are moved. Right? Somebody else has to impact movement and change on them. Man, on the other hand, has the ability to change and move. But where is that choice? And which choice do you make? So you go back to the first ayah we start in the second ayah we discussed today. Ulu qawlan salida. Make the right choice mentally first. It should be correct. Your statement of fact and how you understand this, this amana, this trust, this commitment. Make sure that that is a correct value that you hold. <coughs> my understanding of my role as a child, okay, must coincide with the prophet's understanding. My understanding of my role as a father or mother should be the Prophet's understanding. My understanding of how I should be with my grandparents, my relatives, must be in line with the Sunnah. My understanding of how I should be as a, as a spouse must be in line with the Sunnah and so on. Right? My understanding of how I should be as a ruler and the ruled should be in line with the Sunnah of the Prophet. And my understanding of how I should behave with my employee, employer must be in line with the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, that's the Amana. That makes sense? This is the Amana that we are talking about, that is both individual, it is private, it is social, it is uh, domestic, it is communal, and it is uh, political, and then cosmological. My understanding how I should behave with the food around me, where it comes from, uh, the environment and ecology, must be in line with the Sunnah of the Prophet also. By understanding how the world works, must be in line with what Allah says in the Quran, what the Prophet says in the Sunnah. This is also a trust. 
It all stems from a correct understanding which yields a correct statement and a value system internally. And then that controls your behavior. But if your value system in the first place is warped, distorted, corrupt, and based on vulm and ignorance, injustice and ignorance, then you are the subject of this eye. Right. That my behavior with people is it unjust? That I'll be kind to one person, I'll be unjust to another. That that's not the correct statement that you're holding. Then your statement of fact and value is not going to correct you. It will need to be corrected first. That is the good news. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the Prophet وسلم, to show the human being who could be the most unjust and the most ignorant to be the best. That's the good news. Right? But those who do not do that they will either be of uh, one of two categories. The first is the munafiq. The munafiq who says to people, I am a Muslim, a believer. But he's not. He's just for show. And the other is the mushrik. The mushrik is someone who now says, God is divine, but I'm also divine. God has a right and I also have a right. That's a shirk. I'm not talking about the idol worship, I'm talking about shirk at the more general border level. That internally in our minds we say, why does God dictate upon me? Yeah, because he's God. He dictates upon the heavens, he dictates upon the earth, he dictates upon the mountains and everything else around you. And within that, why cannot he dictate on you? Because you're a munafiq or you're a mushrik. You're not allowing him to. So you are refusing, rejecting by your own will and choice that you don't want God to be God. And you don't want to worship him alone, independent of you and every other value that you hold. Then Allah says that if you carry on this way, since you, meaning all you human beings as a species, you carry the burden of this amana, then there will be a natural effect to this distrust and this disloyalty and this breach of faith, and the breach of contract, which is known in the Qur'an as adab. لِيُعَذِّبَ اللَّهُ الْمُنَافِقِينَ وَالْمُنَافِقَاتُ وَالْمُشْرِكِينَ وَالْمُشْرِكَاتُ That consequently, what will happen is Allah will punish the munafiq women, men, munafiq women, and the mushrik men, and the mushrik women. Why? Because that's the law of cause and effect. If you breach a contract, Someone will suffer. Either you suffer or somebody else suffers. Now in this case, since God will dictate who is going to suffer, He will make sure that you are taught a lesson. Perhaps in this world and, God forbid, in the other world. Okay? But, there is hope. وَيَتُوبُ اللَّهُ عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ May Allah, God will come back to the believing men and to the believing women. If they correct their understanding and their statement, and if they reform their actions, Allah will forgive them through tawbah and come back to them. Tawbah, yatubu him is come back. So Allah now comes back to the believing men, believing women, so that they're able to reassess and re-evaluate their burden, which they said they will carry as a species. Right. Some of you say, uh, we weren't there when we were made to take this choice. Uh, don't be crying, baby. It's too late for that. Um, you have a choice. Either this way or that way. It's too late for that. That's the way your DNA works. That's the way your psyche works. That's the way your blood is in your, in your veins and everything else. Works the way as every human being. You want the pleasures of human being, but you don't want the responsibilities of human being. That's called hedonism. You want life to be just a pleasure, joy, fun, this and that. No, that's not the way human beings are made. The way human beings are made is to make sure that when they meet Allah, as they die and when they die, and on the day of judgment, Allah forgives them. That is your success. In the meantime, in this world, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, through the sunnah 
of the Prophet Wasallam has made many, many issues halal for you to benefit from. The issues that the Sharia and the Sunnah have made haram are fewer than what has been left halal. It's just a myth in the minds of people. Well, everything's haram. Nothing's haram. You can count what's haram in the Quran. One, two, three, four. Right? What actions are haram? And which contracts are haram? That's why you have the ability to write books on fiqh. So what is haram? If everything was haram, then why would you write a book? Everything's haram. Right? So haram is the, expect, is the exception to the rule of what is halal. That is through the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. If you want to enjoy certain natural pleasures, that are in you, innate in you as human beings, then uh, you may do so, but not the expense of being untrustworthy and <coughs> unfaithful to you, to your parents, to your brothers and sisters, to your spouses and to the community, uh, because that is seen as nifaq and hypocrisy. So this, the, the sequence of ayat show us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants the human being especially to know and understand that whether you say the amana is your own individual will and prerogative to differentiate between right and wrong and then act accordingly uh, to your choice, or you say it's the Qur'an that is the amana. If it's the Qur'an, then invariably it means the Prophet Wasallam's deliverance of the Qur'an to all people. Right? So there you see again the institution of Nabuwa and the institution of Muhammad Wasallam is preserved in every human being because every human being took on the responsibility of this amana, of this trust. وَكَانَ اللَّهُ غَفُورُ Rahima. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is exceptionally forgiving and exceptionally merciful. Okay. So this is as, as far as uh, the basic understanding of these concluding ayat of the surah goes. Inshallah next week, when inshallah the next week tafsir is at noon, by the way, you may come at 11 by all means, read some Quran, do some dhikr, make dua for us, dua for us. But the tafsir will start at 12. Yeah. We'll wrap up the whole surah. Inshallah next week. Jazakumullah khair. Subhanallah. Alhamdulillah. Assalamu alaikum.